ladies and gentlemen, um, colleagues, students, stakeholders, members of the public, welcome uh, to UCL. It's my very great pleasure to open the series uh, the, uh, of lunch hour lectures that um, happen over the course of uh, each of our terms. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today, as Nicholas said, about my view of where we've got to with UCL 2034, our strategy, uh, and I'll talk a little bit around the edges of that as we go through. Um, the first uh, thing I want to say is that we are, without doubt, a world-leading university, and we are driven by academic endeavour and academic excellence. The next period for us really is about securing our long-term future at that world-leading uh, level of performance. Um, as Nicola alluded to, we um, exist in a changing world uh, which poses us some potential difficulties. Uh, I am, of course, uh, referring to uh, the potential changes to the funding of higher education, which have been leaked and discussed uh, in the press. Uh, the current position, as I understand it, is that the government has told us that the fee will be £9,250 for this, this and coming years, but that we will not enjoy any uh, increase above that level uh, in the foreseeable future. There have been rumours of dropping that fee to £7,500, which, uh, whilst good at one level, does create quite significant difficulties in the institutional level. A quick uh, back of the fag packet calculation is that that could cost this university some £22 uh, million pounds per annum. Some other good things have happened recently for the students who are incurring uh, these uh, loans and this level of debt, and that is that the threshold at which students are now asked to repay has been raised from £21,000 per annum in their salary up to £25,000. We also ask for the reinstatement of maintenance loans. That has not occurred. Uh, but uh, some changes to the interest rate were announced earlier this week. That's the interest rate that students pay on their loan, <coughs> uh, which was RPI plus 3%. Uh, that now uh, only kicks in at £45,000 of income, and it's a lower rate of interest down to RPI only at the threshold of 25000 so some movement in the right direction, but signals from the government that that's the beginning of change and that there's further review to come. And we do not know yet uh, what they're thinking and what the proposals uh, might be. So for us, that represents some difficulty. We are also, of course, facing uh, Brexit. Um, and uh, literally, if you read the newspapers today, there are differing reports. The British side thinks some progress was made yesterday. The Europeans think not. Uh, on phase one of the negotiations. Uh, I am an optimist. I do think that we will uh, get through phase one, albeit probably not in the time frame originally envisaged. Uh, and I hope, therefore, that after that, we can have a sensible and, and positive discussion about our ongoing relationship with Europe with regard to science, uh, research, uh, and uh, innovation, all of which are critical. Uh, to this uh, institution. Um, how, what's, what's our best response to that changing environment? And, and my answer actually is a very, uh, very simple one. All the time that we display great excellence uh, in our education, in our research, and in our innovation, we're in the safest position possible uh, during uh, that uh, period of change. Uh, we also need world-class uh, support from our professional services for that academic endeavour. Um, we need to literally transform the quality of our professional services. I'm not going to linger on that today. It may well come up in questioning, uh, but there will be more about that for you over the course of the next uh, few weeks uh, and months. Uh, but I do see it as being critically important to our future. Um, our strategy, UCL 2034, uh, was uh, designed to protect us uh, into the future and to give us a clear um, set of guidelines to, by which we could conduct uh, our academic uh, uh, activity. We have, of course, been putting some meat behind the, uh, behind the bones of that strategy in terms of, so how does that actually translate through into a plan? And we now do have a very uh, good annual planning process. Many people in the room 
uh, will have been uh, involved in it. Uh, and it's a process that starts at the bottom and works it, its way up. So many of you will have been involved in discussions in your individual departments, schools or faculties. Uh, I get to see all of that when it's um, agglomerated into a faculty level plan uh, and we go through and critique it. But through that process we've identified a number of projects which we think uh, help us with the, with the medium term. And if you look at this university, um, you can see the preeminence uh, and success of medicine and life sciences, uh, all in the top 10 uh, in a global um, uh, league table. Uh, you can also see that for arts and humanities and social sciences and laws. Uh, engineering, maths and physical sciences tends to feature a bit lower. Uh, still very good, still in the top 25 to 50th in the world. Uh, and so quite a lot of what we're trying to do is to, first of all, make sure that those that are at the top can stay there, but secondly, to work hard to bring uh, those other disciplines up to that uh, ultimate uh, world-class level. And against that background, there are some big projects running, which I wrote about uh, in uh, the Provost View uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and just very briefly, they are uh, a school of uh, economics and public policy, bringing those two departments together. Uh, and co-housing them with the Institute of Fiscal Studies, an external uh, agency. Um, uh, a new Institute of Mathematical and Statistical Sciences, bringing together those two part departments into hopefully much better space. Um, and Creative and Applied uh, Humanities is another area where we think uh, developments uh, could occur. <laughs> and then, of course, there is the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, contentious in some quarters, but my viewpoint is really straightforward. It's absolutely fundamentally important to the future of this university that we take that opportunity, run with the ball, uh, and develop ourselves uh, in that uh, arena. It's also critically linked to building um, the success of, uh, particularly of engineering. Around about 50% of the activity on that Olympic Park uh, will be the developments in engineering uh, particularly um, uh, advanced propulsion, uh, robotics, the Institute of Making Big, um, uh, amongst other things. So, so uh, that's an opportunity that we have to grab hold of, and I'm more than happy to uh, take questions about it later. Um, let, me, let me come then on to UCL 2034. Now, I, I know you all know this back to front, but I thought I'd just give you a little reminder uh, of what the principal uh, themes are and the uh, key uh, enablers. I'm, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through that list and we're just going to give you a little bit of an update in each of those areas. I'm somewhat inevitably uh, going to focus more on the principal academic themes than I am going to uh, on the enablers, but there are a few things I want to say in both quarters. Um, before, I, before I start with the themes, let me just, uh, I've been asked this question a lot recently, so I thought I'd put this right up front. How are we doing in terms of student recruitment this year? Because obviously with the turmoil, with the uh, issues uh, about immigration, with changes uh, around Europe, uh, people have been worried. Uh, and I'm uh, very happy to report um, that we're doing uh, very well. In fact, it looks a little bit as though we're going to be slightly over target rather than uh, under recruiting. Uh, the numbers are quite fascinating. This is a snapshot that was taken about four or five days ago, by the way. Um, so the data is already out of sync. Uh, there are about, we think, another 1,500 or so students uh, still to uh, enrol. Uh, but when we uh, looked at that data, um, it's quite interesting. Uh, 5,714 uh, undergraduates against a target of 5.6. So UK enrolment was currently, at uh, this stage, just slightly short, 246 uh, students. Um, EU was 250 above target, uh, not necessarily what you would be expecting to hear, and overseas 105 over target. There are similar figures for um, postgraduate tour. I won't go into the detail to save time. Uh, suffice it to say that we think we're going to uh, be just above uh, our uh, overall target, but we will be down on home EU and up a lot on international. So the international is counterbalancing changes in the home uh, market. It is, of course, the beginning of a demographic uh, dip. 
um, which ca carries on for the next four or five years for home uh, and EU students. Now, let me come then to um, the principal themes. And I'll start with academic leadership and academic excellence. This is the theme that I personally lead. Um, and I'm just going to give you one piece of data that helps you get a feel for where we think we are. And that is that we follow those infernal world lead tables. Uh, we don't follow them religiously. They come, they come out um, with great regularity. We follow five of them. Um, and what we do in order to sort of smooth out the differences in methodologies is that we create a ranked mean average uh, for each institution and look at our position in that ranked mean average. And I can tell you that at the moment, I'm very proud of this, uh, that we uh, rank uh, in seventh position globally across those five uh, world lead tables. And that just gives you a feel for the scale uh, and the quality of this uh, institution um, to perform at that level. I'm going to come quickly now on to the integration of research and education. I, I have played this very large uh, uh, since I've been here uh, at UCR, and that's because I felt that we needed to do better in terms of our student education and student experience. It was always my intention that the research stays up here and the education comes up to reach the same sort of international quality. Um, lots of people have been worried that an emphasis on education will allow uh, the research to fall away. Uh, and the bottom line is very simple. That, that is not happening, uh, as I'll cover shortly. Uh, in our efforts to integrate research and education, we have seen some improvements. Uh, I was very pleased that we got a silver award in the Teaching Excellence Framework. I think it would have been possible for us to get bronze. I think with our National Student Survey data, historically it would have been almost impossible uh, for us to get gold. So silver was a good outcome. And it was a good outcome because we were able to show that we are tackling areas of weakness in assessment and feedback um, and uh, in academic support. Uh, so those of you who are involved in the personal tutor scheme, uh, I see that as being uh, very important for our future. And I'd like to give it a very strong and uh, positive plug. Uh, the other thing that the TEF looks at is outcomes data for our students. Uh, and again, there, we're doing very well. Um, if you look at how many of our students are unemployed, this is Delhi data, so it's data taken six months uh, after graduation. Only 1.7% of our students remain unemployed uh, six months later, and 86.8% of our undergraduates are in um, a highly skilled uh, a high school work or continued uh, postgraduate study. And that figure goes up to 92.8 for postgraduate tour and 97.9 for our postgraduate uh, research students. I think there's still more work to be done. I'd like to see that figure for our undergraduates rise higher. And to that end, uh, we have started a careers uh, registration scheme, which essentially uh, provides personal information and personal support to each individual student and, and takes them through the pathway uh, to eventually acquiring uh, a high quality uh, job. Uh, in our uh, uh, education as well, uh, there are several other things I'd like to say. So first of all, um, I think we should commend Dilly Fung um, and the work that she's done on correct, connected curriculum. Um, and the book that she's recently published, if you haven't seen it, you can get a free PDF of it from um, uh, from uh, the uh, UCL Press. Um, I can tell you that there have been some 1,500 downloads of that book uh, globally uh, involving uh, over 150 countries. So the impact that we're having with our thoughts about how to connect uh, research and education are slowly but surely uh, going uh, absolutely global. Uh, there are other things that I look at uh, that give me some indication of whether or not we're taking our education seriously enough. Um, and just the other day, I hosted uh, and presented at um, the Arena Awards. So these are people acquiring fellowships um, uh, of the Higher Education Academy. These are, in essence, professional qualifications. I gave out certificates to 120 people. And we have literally doubled the number of people in the last four years who have that qualification from 16 to 30%. Uh, um, I am a medic, medic, so my maths is always slightly out, roughly doubled uh, uh, the number. 
Uh, and that's a fantastic achievement. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone that, um, that has really taken that uh, very seriously and put themselves forward for those um, uh, activities uh, and subsequent uh, awards. Uh, the other thing I, I would say about that is um, I was completely amazed at the uh, incredible diversity, both, both the gender balance uh, and the racial mix of people who are acquiring those awards here at UCL. It was deeply, uh, deeply uh, impressive. Um, I, did, I alluded to research just now, and I'll come on to that. Um, so what's happening to our research performance? The short answer is it's going through uh, the roof. We doubled our research income uh, be between 2014, um, uh, uh, sorry, 2016, 2006. We increased our research income by about 280%, up to around about 430 uh, million pounds per annum or so. The figure for last year was 494 million. And that was a £40 million pound increase on the, on the year before. So everyone that's been worried about, you know, are we still performing in the research arena? Please don't. We're performing brilliantly. We're also, by the way, number one uh, in the country for research council income this year, uh, with a total of around about uh, £85 million. Uh, We did very well, as you know, in REF 2014. Uh, the other thing to report is that all of the preparations for the next REF, REF 2021, 20, uh, are already uh, underway. Uh, and I think it would be our ambition uh, to stay in the same position as being the best in terms of research power. That's quality multiplied by number of staff, uh, where we were first last time and managed to be above Oxford and Cambridge and Imperial. I can't imagine why I chose those three uh, institutions to comment on. Um, there's also been uh, a revamp. Uh, of our approach to research in terms of grand uh, challenges. Um, so we looked at the four that we were running and asked ourselves the question, were they the right ones? Were we doing well enough? Uh, and the general answer was that we felt that we were doing pretty well, um, but that we felt that um, our portfolio could expand. So we started two new ones, uh, and that uh, the, the, they're, they're entitled um, Justice and Equality, uh, you can imagine why uh, we would want to uh, be prominent in that, uh, in this institution. And then also transformative technologies. There's a lot going on in the world that relates to technologies that are going to change the world we live in. We need to be involved in research activity on a cross-disciplinary uh, basis uh, in um, the development of transformative uh, technologies and the impacts that they're going to have uh, on the society uh, that we live in. Um, if we come then to uh, number four, accessible and publicly engaged, then this um, is uh, where we look at things like our performance in winding participation, uh, our performance in um, uh, public and community uh, engagement, um, and um, our relationship with our alumni uh, and our fundraising activity. Uh, and I'll start with the fundraising. So. In September 2016, we launched the campaign called uh, It's All Academic. Uh, and the objective there was to do two things, really, to raise money, some £600 million, but also to generate something like 250,000 volunteering hours uh, from our alumni uh, on a global uh, scale. Uh, we're one year on from that launch day. Um, there have been something like 25 UK-based and international uh, events. Some 4,000 people have been involved and the campaign total has already reached £347 million, which has come from 12,640 donors. Those are staggering uh, figures uh, and I'm incredibly uh, proud uh, of what we've achieved in that regard. We've also uh, delivered 73,000 volunteering hours, uh, 3,000 volunteers involved in that and again uh, in over 100 countries. And we have 3,200 alumni who are acting as mentors uh, for uh, current uh, students and for recent uh, graduates. So that is a big uh, plus. We've also started a benefactor circle. The other night we, um, we inducted into the benefactor circle some 51 organizations or individuals who'd given us uh, over 
uh, a million pounds. Uh, you'll see their names appearing in the not too distant future on those lovely uh, new walls at the back of the um, uh, of the Wilkins Terrace uh, a, 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 as you approach the back of the Bloomsbury Theatre, so that you, we can celebrate uh, publicly uh, their uh, their contribution. Uh, widening participation, um, we set ourselves pretty challenging uh, targets uh, in our offer agreement, and I'm delighted to report to you that we're meeting them all. Uh, and that is a major mechanism of making sure that UCL continues to be open to all, uh, regardless of uh, background. Um, we're also this year piloting something called Access UCL, uh, and that's four departments who are taking part in a pilot scheme where we look at reducing uh, the uh, A-level grades, reducing the uh, requirement for A-level grades um, uh, for students from disadvantaged backgrounds. Uh, and the intention of that pilot is that, is that if it is successful, we can spread that out more widely. And as we thought about student numbers into the future and mitigating against the effects of changes uh, in the EU, our thoughts have turned to how do we get more people from low-income backgrounds to come to uh, this institution, uh, rather than the sort of wider uh, aspects of uh, marketing. Um, public engagement, I'm going to come back to this at the end of my uh, talk, uh, because I think this has become more important than ever uh, in recent times, uh, and I'll explain that in a bit more detail. But um, uh, the now called UCL culture, previously public and community uh, engagement, have, got, uh, have developed and are now delivering a refreshed uh, strategy. Uh, and, the, and the intent of that is to form much stronger links between that central service uh, and the departments so that we can be more effective at getting uh, our message out there uh, into the world. Um, let me just come now to um, London's Global University and to think a little bit about London. Uh, so, um, w what I want to say is that UCL has got an intimate and close relationship with London and we are attempting to manage that relationship uh, more effectively. Uh, and the sort of thing that we're doing uh, is contributing to thinking on the urban environment and infrastructure. That's obviously uh, an activity largely from, uh, but not exclusively, from the BART there. Uh, we've got much closer engagement with London schools. And for this coming year, there's a particular focus on building capacity in schools uh, to recruit and develop excellent teachers and leaders in the teaching uh, profession, uh, and also enhancing uh, the Institute of Education's support for the most uh, disadvantaged schools. Uh, and innovation and enterprise, also uh, we tend to look at that under this particular theme, um, w what I am happy to report is that we've managed to double the number of student enterprise activities, startup businesses, uh, at that new base in Camley Street. I think it's called Base KX. Um, and we've doubled the number of um, activities uh, amongst our students uh, over the last uh, two years. Um, we have also uh, developed much closer links with uh, Big Industry, particularly Cap Gemini. IBM, Siemens, Deliveroo, Boehringer, Ingelheim. These are just a few names of companies that we're trying to work much more closely with. Um, uh, and in indeed, if you uh, look at your email today, you'll see that um, Joe Johnson has just given a lecture about the knowledge exchange framework. So we've now got the REF, the TEF, and the KEF. What will they think of next? Um, and, uh, uh, and our performance uh, in terms of our interaction with industry is going to be something that they will use to measure us, and that will be used to inform our funding uh, for that function. So uh, everything keeps changing almost by the day. And then delivering global uh, impact, um, we had a major change um, uh, in our strategy uh, in terms of um, what we do, we're doing internationally. We don't even call it our internationalization strategy. We call it our global engagement strategy. And I think that says absolutely everything. This is about working with others on a global scale to make a difference. Um, and our partnerships are developing uh, in a very positive way. And a lot of you have put a lot of effort into this. Uh, and I'm very, very grateful for it. I suppose our number one relationship, the one that's got the most strength and has 
uh, had the most attention is our relationship uh, with uh, Peking University, which I think we would describe as a deep and strategic partnership involving at least uh, eight uh, faculties, uh, many different projects, staff exchange, student exchange, uh, and all of those activities. And we're working with others to build to that level. Uh, the uh, collaborative with Yale fits into that category, and that's uh, also going extremely well. Uh, we are developing relationships with the University of Toronto uh, in Canada, with New York University uh, in uh, New York, a very close relationship historically between uh, the two institutions. But we're also looking to Europe. We've been to see the Max Planck Society uh, recently about our uh, ongoing relationship with them. Uh, and we're beginning to look at uh, India, the All India Medical Science Institute and the Institute of Science in Bangalore. Um, so uh, that is uh, our approach uh, to partnership working, uh, now proving to be highly successful. We're also making slow uh, but steady progress on increasing uh, the, the outward mobility of our students so that more of them spend uh, time abroad. Uh, we increased the number of those supported from 829 uh, to 894 uh, over the course uh, of the last year. Um, so, let's come to uh, the, uh, quickly to the enablers. I'm keeping half an eye on a time, so I'm going to speed up and go very quickly. Uh, supporting our students more effectively uh, is critically important. There's a huge effort going on. I could spend 45 minutes on that effort alone. I did just want to highlight, because I know it um, uh, is, has been a big issue, uh, we are spending a lot of money in trying to fix Portico. Um, through that academic model, model project, um, and that will be um, will get really get going in earnest during the course uh, of this academic year, and it will be a very welcome uh, development. We're doing lots of work to uh, refurbish our halls. Uh, we've opened 300, sorry, 534 new study spaces for students uh, over the past year, uh, and of course, you will have seen the new student centre, which will have over a thousand. Uh, spaces for students uh, rising out of the ground that will be completed uh, in 2018. Uh, which of course brings me to the estate. Uh, on my tombstone it will say he died of space, brackets, lack of. Uh, and um, uh, something that I inherited, but I'm delighted to tell you that we spent £170 million uh, in the last year. Um, and we've got eight major projects, all based in and around Bloomsbury, that will complete um, sometime in the next uh, few months, uh, certainly by uh, the beginning of uh, February. Um, so some examples, 22 Gordon Street, for those of you who haven't been there, the new School of Architecture, an absolutely brilliant development, uh, very proud of it. The Wilkins Terrace, I walked past that yesterday. It was packed with international students having lunch, exactly what I had hoped for. Uh, and it was wonderful to uh, see it being so effective. It was a complete mess when I arrived. I literally looked out the window and said, what on earth is that? Actually, I don't think it was quite as polite as that. Uh, what on earth is that? Uh, and I was told it's the physics yard. Uh, so with apologies to physics, it looked like physics had opened all the windows and thrown everything out that they didn't want. So we completely gutted it. And uh, underneath the terrace that you can see, there's still uh, delivery facilities and places to park your cycles, but we've now got a brilliant new uh, social space for students and staff linked to the new uh, refectory. And when the Bloomsbury Theatre is finished, which will be, again be next summer, you'll be able to buy a drink at the bar and wander out the back of the Bloomsbury and enjoy the terrace uh, in the interval. Uh, and that's uh, a wonderful thing to see. Uh, I'm not going to go into the long list of all the uh, other projects. Uh, but I do want to make the point that pretty much 75% of everything that we're spending is actually being spent on the Bloomsbury estate. 25% or so uh, will ultimately uh, go to uh, the Olympic Park. Uh, we're also um, revamping uh, other aspects of our infrastructure, uh, and in particular, uh, uh, spending a lot of money on our systems and processes particularly our IT systems. Uh, we've also had uh, the development of uh, some major high-performance computing facilities. That's predominantly uh, for research, of course. 
but I am proud to say that we now have literally uh, the most powerful high performance computing facilities of any uh, UK university, something that befits uh, an institution uh, of our level of excellence. I'm going to accelerate through the rest of this and get to my uh, finishing points. Um, on the people side, uh, we could discuss this during um, uh, the question and answer session, but I'm very proud of what we've done, what we've attempted to do and are continuing to do for all of our uh, European citizens, both staff uh, and students. We continue to push our government to a sensible place uh, so that the future of those individuals and their contribution to this country and, of course, to UCL uh, is uh, secure. We're also having a major push on equality and diversity. We've got our Athena Swan Silver at an institutional level. We've now got our first few, I think, two gold um, departmental level uh, awards. Uh, the Race Equality Charter Mark, we were uh, a bronze. I think our latest concern, and one that I've uh, been involved in personally, uh, has been to be concerned about uh, sexual harassment and bullying, uh, something that's very topical, of course, in the news as it relates to Hollywood. Uh, but we do not want that sort of behavior here on this campus at all. Uh, and we're looking at ways to tackle it. And please don't think we're immune from it. There are some significant problems uh, that I think we uh, need to address. And I'm going to finish uh, with money. And all I'm going to say about money is thank you all for all the hard work that everyone's done in achieving uh, a reasonable surplus. The surplus achieved last year was 4.5%, which is still way lower than the rest of the Russell Group, by the way, the average for the Russell Group. Uh, but it's a big change for this university, and a lot of hard work has gone into uh, making uh, that happen. And what does that do for us? Well, uh, first of all, uh, I, I don't know about you, but as we go into a period of financial uncertainty about our future, then I would um, be much happier if we go in uh, with a small cushion available. And secondly, of course, it gives us the money to invest in our future, particularly uh, our estates, but also uh, in our people in due course. So my conclusion, and let's move to questions and answers. I think we're doing really well, but somewhat inevitably there is much more to do. Uh, I think we should hold our nerve. I think we should stay focused. And I think we should continue with our plans. I do not think we should back off because of the uncertain environment. Uh, in fact, I'm very confident that we will get through it uh, because we're UCL and because we're based uh, in London. And I just wanted to finish by saying something about the important role that universities have in society and how important we will be uh, in a period of great change uh, in our country. And, and we are, whether we like it or not, in a global society that's now uh, dealing with the rise of populism, uh, concerns about immigration, fake news, uh, and distrust of experts. Uh, and in that environment, to my mind, universities become more, uh, not less important. Uh, we're open and we're welcome to all. Uh, we're welcoming to all. Uh, we're tolerant and we simply want to attract the best talent that we can. Gender, race, social background, sexual orientation, disability, we welcome all and we will continue to do so. This isn't new uh, for UCL, but we should remember it, we should be very proud of it, and we should protect it. Uh, we are the providers and custodians of evidence. Universities are about measuring things, testing things. Uh, we're about the verifiable, we're about the reproducible. The importance of that has not gone away just because of changes in society. Again, my view is uh, that they've become more important. So we're a force for the public good. The knowledge that we create and the graduates and scholars of this university do a lot for the public good. Uh, whether that's research to innovation, I could talk about the NHS, I could talk about primary or secondary education, our involvement in that, uh, we uh, contribute to wealth uh, and prosperity uh, without doubt. So I put it to you that that's of fundamental importance to the future of our country, uh, to the economy, and to the prosperity of British citizens. We have, in the United Kingdom, a world-leading higher education sector. And UCL is a key player in that. We're a key player in London. We're a key player uh, uh, across the UK. Uh, and we are a key player globally. So we need to focus 
and keep it that way. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Michael. Um, we've got just a little time for questions because there's a lecture starting in this room at two o'clock. Please wait for the mic to reach you. I can see a hand up there already. Let's start with that one. Uh, and there's another one down here. If the second student ambassador could bring a mic down here. Let's take those two questions first. Please tell your name and uh, a short question. Sure. Um, I'm Sabira. I'm a third year medic. So this is actually stemming off one of the closing points you made about universities playing a vital role in society. So I wanted to say, given the global platform that UCL prides itself on, and also given the general consensus on the need for urgency in tackling climate change, why has UCL not divested yet? Why does UCL not? Why has UCL not divested yet? Divested, sorry, I didn't hear what you said. Um, the second question as well. Yeah, I'll... We're going to collect a few questions. So I have four questions. First question is, so you've covered a lot of what you've done in relationship to SDGC, and that's very excellent, very exciting. So first part of my question is, where are we, where do we still need to put more effort and more attention to making it happen? And then the second question is, in relationship to that, what is missing in the UCL environment? What is missing the presence of would make a difference if you were to appear? Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm going to start with your question and come back to yours, if I may. Um, <laughs> What, what, what do we need to do more of? Well, I still think we need to focus even more effort on our students and the student experience, including the education and your involvement as students in uh, engaging in the future of this uh, institution. And when I look around UCL, I think there are parts of UCL that are absolutely brilliant at this, and they tend to be the ones that score very highly uh, in the National Student Survey, and I can see people in the audience who I know are part of that excellence. But there are other parts uh, where that doesn't happen as well. Uh, so that patchiness is something that troubles me. Um, because obviously everyone's in the same environment, everyone's using the same uh, lecture theatres, everyone's, you know, everything else is the same, but the atmosphere in the department for students is very different. So that relationship between students, the department, the education they receive, the environment that they're in, is where we need to uh, focused uh, the most attention. And what do we need more of? Simple, space and money. Um, obvious. But, but it, it does, I mean, it literally does uh, occupy so much of my time, this space issue. It, it's, it's extraordinary. Uh, I, 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 I've had something like seven uh, requests been escalated to my desk for additional space because people are basically not able to get their work done properly because of the lack of space. So it's a huge issue, and that's why I think the Olympic Park is important. But it's not the only uh, place that we're requiring uh, land and access to property. There are many uh, other projects that are currently active. Uh, we've got to hold our nerve and push through uh, and make those investments. And I think, uh, by definition, there was a long period of underinvestment in this institution. And then divestment. Um, so uh, how the university's money, we, we, we have an endowment of about 150 million. Uh, it's controlled uh, by an investment committee. That investment committee looked at divesting last year, uh, uh, engaging the council at the same time. They've moved over to uh, a, a process which is called the Climate Active Fund. We've decided not to go with the company, Saracen, that actually had that fund. We've decided to put our money in parallel investments to that fund. And the reason we've done that is so that we can, if we wish to, uh, decrease our investment uh, in fossil fuels. So the latest I heard about this was at the audit committee this week. Uh, and I was delighted to hear that there are going to be two students on that investment committee, and that those two students and members of the investment committee are going to be meeting with the investment managers to discuss concerns about this. So I think we have shifted a little further towards uh, less investment in fossil fuels, but you are right that we have not yet fully uh, divested. Uh, Thank you. We've got some time. Move, some movement in the right direction. Sorry, Michael. We've got time for one more question here, please. Hi, 
Hi, yeah, I'm Robert Thompson. I'm in the Department of Electronic and Electrical Engineering. And when you talk about your themes, you mentioned lots about integrating research with education. You talked about enterprise. You talk about public engagement. These are all skill sets that perhaps haven't always naturally sat with the core academics that would be employed um, as kind of the, the engine house of the university. Um, and I'd like to see how you see the, the career path of academics and the type of academics that UCL looks at hiring may change as we move forward and how UCL is going to help bring academics in that can have that diverse range of expertise and abilities. Yeah, I'll, I'll start answering that question by um, doing a little comparison. So. Well, I, I got asked a lot when I came here, what's the difference between UCL and LEED, which is where I was vice chancellor before. Um, and one of the differences is that the very best people I could work with in LEED could easily be members of staff here at UCL. The difference is everybody at UCL is of that standard. So already, uh, as we recruit, we're looking for proven uh, excellence in uh, research, and education and the relationship between the two. Uh, I think, you know, the loud message I got from Brexit uh, and from those who were feeling disenfranchised and people <coughs> who distrusted universities and people like me is that they didn't really understand what we're about, uh, nor that we're for the public good. Um, and, uh, uh, and they regard us as being rather elitist. So there are, I think there are two ways that we can combat that. Uh, and the most important thing is that I think all of our academic staff need to start thinking about how they relate their science, their research activity more generally across all of the disciplines to the general public and, 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 and inform them about why it's a good idea to have world-class uh, universities uh, in their midst. So that's a new skill set for... For, um, uh, for many academic staff. This university is uh, particularly good at it because it's been trying to, to, to develop this over a number of years now. But I think the need for it and the need to spread it out, and hence uh, UCL Culture's public and cultural engagement, working much more closely with departments is critical. But I, I think, you know, right from myself uh, through to every other member of staff. You know, I, I don't pretend to be an expert in this. I'm not sure I've ever been that good at it myself. Uh, so we need to work hard with you. We need to give you some training. We need to give you some confidence. We need to give you some experience. Uh, and I think it will be critically important for all academics to be able to be in this space uh, uh, from, from here on in. That's all we've got time for, I'm afraid. Uh, will you please join me in thanking the President and Provost of UCL?